My name is Eric Zoberman, and I am very excited to welcome you all to Empowered Nonprofits First Empower Hour of 2020. For those of you that are joining us for 2022, <laughs> Eric, you're, a little, you're stuck back in 2020. It looks like I, the last two years. I, I, I wish. <laughs> um, for, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the idea behind Empowered Hours, regardless of what year they are held in, um, it was born out of the, the all too common reality that I think a lot of you on this call, a lot of nonprofits face every day that we are so consumed, so overstretched, addressing these community challenges, delivering for our stakeholders and just simply treading water every day that we rarely get a chance to, you know, like take a step back and give real strategic attention to some huge challenges. So we're gonna, in a minute here, dive into introductions and all these other formalities that are a part of conversations like this. But we wanna start off a little bit differently. You all are the ones that are doing this every day. You all are the ones that chose to take an hour out of your uh, busy schedule today to join a conversation on this specific topic. So we, I think, would be remiss if we did not begin this conversation by hearing from all of you. So our administrator, perfect, I see it on my, my screen at least, just pulled up a single poll question. This is a question, at least in my opinion, that should be relatively straightforward, but I think like everything in this world these days, um, that your answer might look different in a, a day from now, a week from now, but answer the question on behalf of your organization for right now. It'll just give us a sense of what an event looks like to you at this moment. So take a moment, we'll uh, view all the results together here in, in about 10 seconds. And there are, there are no, no wrong answers. All right, so um, we are all viewing this for the first time together, by the way. Um, so as suspected, a little bit of everything, definitely probably a trend towards in-person. Like I said before, there um, are really no wrong answers, but we are not here today to advocate for one specific type of event. Um, in fact, as guidelines, as guidelines evolve, you all obviously need to adhere to the guidelines, but they should be viewed as one of many best practices and considerations that you need to take into account when deciding what is best for your attendees your organization. Just a quick example of that. Um, if you are, if you work with an at-risk population, you might, you're going to want to take an extra degree of precaution. Um, so I say all that up at the front because I want everybody to be able to visualize what we're about to talk about and think about the conversation we're about to have through the perspective of their own organization. So we, we can go back to the deck here because I'm very proud of our next slide. Um, we, so just as important as what you all are doing is how you all are feeling about, what, um, about the events that you have going on. So let's all take a moment, go to the chat box, same chat box we're gonna be using, and I'll talk more about that in a minute throughout the conversation, but go to the chat box, select an emoji that best represents your all frame of mind um, at this moment regarding events. So I know there's, it's probably uh, asking you to choose between a few, but let's see, what emoji describes your feeling towards events at this very second? Oh, these are generally positive. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. I'm gonna give this another like five seconds here to come in. Eric, I just I'm wanna, um kind of go back to something you said about we're not here to advocate or kind of promote a certain type of event. We're here to help you advocate yourself as you choose what event is best for you and your organization. So we're going to try and give you as much information as possible so you feel like you have the best information to make an informed decision and then advocate appropriately for that. So um, yes, thank you, um, Alyssa. And while we're while we're getting the last few 
I'll see as more of these come in, they're I think more starting to reflect how I'm feeling about organizations, about uh, events. It just it just took a minute. Um, while we're getting the last few of those in, um, uh, just want to give a few quick suggestions, a little bit of fine print to ensure that by the end of this conversation, we are all either smiley face emoji or or better yet, I, I when I saw them earlier, I want to aim for light bulb emoji. Um, so we are, um, where this session is being recorded, we're going to, we'll share the recording with all of you via email after the, afterwards. There is also transcription services available that we are utilizing for the first time. There should be an icon at the bottom um, called live transcript with that little CC button. Um, press it, play with it, experiment with it. Um, just like your events, we want to make sure that our events are accessible um, to everybody, both in real time and moving forward. If you're having trouble with that, feel free to just drop it, drop quickly in the chat that um, what your question is, or um, if we can help you and a member of the Empower team can walk you through that. But most importantly, before we dive in, I just want to emphasize that we want the next 50 minutes to be a real discussion. Utilize that box to ask questions. And most importantly, as we dive into the, the content here, tell us what best practices, challenges, opportunities um, you've all been experiencing uh, over oh, the yeah. past. It's mine. Past. Thank you. Um, we're also going to go through, we have some great questions submitted ahead of time. We're going to sprinkle those in as we go, but utilize the chat box. Um, some Empower team members might address um, some stuff that come up as we go, and we will also, like I said, work them into the conversation. So with all of that out of the way, and let's, um, yeah, there it is. With all that on the way, I would, I'm very excited to um, introduce you all to our panel, to our panelists today. Um, we have three incredible panelists who really have seen it all over these past two years. Stephanie Pessis-Weil, Alyssa Burrs, and Rochelle Allswing have been tackling pandemic-induced challenges for all sorts of community organizations. In the process, they've turned challenges into innovation and opportunity, including, uh, dare I say, some opportunities that should probably be considered moving forward, regardless of what events might look like in the months, the years, the hours to come. So as we, as we begin our conversation, I wanna just drive home that last point a little bit. We realize how fluid everything is. Our team was joking last night that ideas we came up with two weeks ago, like we are questioning whether or not they were still relevant. Um, we concluded that not only are they for sure still relevant, but the evolving nature of both official COVID restrictions and individuals' various comfort levels now makes this kind of the perfect time to put it all out there and have an honest conversation about what events, um, what events look like moving forward and what we've learned from the pandemic. So our first three slides that our panelists are going to take you all through are going to discuss in this order observations, challenges, and key learnings that have come that have come from the events that they've managed during the pandemic. And our hope is that they're going to demonstrate that not all has been lost, that with regards to the effective revenue generating events that your organization needs to thrive, the pandemic's been an opportunity to learn to innovate, to become more inclusive, and to move forward in a productive way, which is how we'll wrap up our conversation by discussing. So finally, with all of that, you now get to hear from someone else. I am gonna turn it over to um, my colleague and to Empower Nonprofits Empowerment Officer and just general all around strategic planning guru, Rochelle Allswing, to talk a little bit about what she has observed in the, in, from events these last couple of years. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy that we can have this conversation. Um, I am Rochelle, and I'm here to kind of dive in and share what are the facts? What are the things that we've seen um, happen during events these past two years? Um, and I think this will paint a picture of what are we seeing that worked and what should we keep in mind as we move forward and think about events in 2022 and beyond. So I'm going to highlight a few. Um, I'm the, you can read the bullet points on the deck, but I'm just going to dive into the top three, which I think are super important and will frame the conversation. So to start off, virtual events allowed people to really have access to organizations that they never knew about or they never had the opportunity to engage with. 
So virtual events open the door to not just tackle audiences and communities in your specific areas, but it opened the door to invite people from across the country. And I think that was something super powerful to see the numbers on the Zoom, to see the number of people attending and learning about new organizations. And people felt really strong to be able to give back to organizations during these times and, uh, and, and, and kind of give back to their communities. So people from different demographics were reaching out, people from um, different socioeconomic statuses were involved in events. And I think that opened the door to organizations to kind of see, hey, we have other people that are interested. And um, and speaking of the larger audience, you know, these events weren't $300 a ticket. So that allowed people from a low barrier um, entry point to join. Um, and that resulted in really higher um, low dollar gifts, which we will talk later on about this specific group of people that we need to continue to cultivate and steward moving forward as we either go back to old habits and create in-person events or continue to leverage this opportunity of mass uh, access. Um, the other thing that we saw and production cost increased. And of course they did because people were really investing in streaming platforms and fundraising platforms and in different modalities to create a multimedia experience. You know, over time, people were on the computer a lot. So organizations had to think creatively of how we can continue to engage our donors, engage our audiences so they feel connected. And it's not just a blank screen with someone talking. So um, with that, yes, production costs could go down, but at the same time, you didn't have the other types of costs. So you didn't have catering, you didn't have um, specific uh, um, in like in person vendors, you didn't have the venue. So, you know, it was kind of like a like a scale, it went up in other ways, but it obviously cut down costs because you didn't have to pay per person at a seated event. Um, and with that production cost, people really saw how important it is to invest in proper storytelling, that people weren't just getting up there and telling their story, but production companies really showed organizations the magic of using video, of using B-roll, of using all these different ways to tell a story, incorporating social media, incorporating reels, incorporating um, all these different ways to kind of interact with the audience, interact with their honorees, interact with their sponsors. Um, and that really helped organizations kind of use this opportunity for virtual that yes, it had many challenges, which Alyssa will um, speak through to shortly. But at the end of the day, these, these virtual events showed that they're not standalone. Events usually, you know, you show up, you're there, you participate in the paddle raise, you paid for your ticket and you leave. But this new experience of building up to the event, having proper and more engaging follow-up allowed the donor and allowed the audience to be able to feel a part of everything. And this new way of thinking of materials that you created continue on throughout their entire um, annual campaign. And we're going to really talk about that later on for opportunities. But I just wanted to kind of start us off with the facts of what did we learn what do we see that worked during these times um, and how we can use these big elements of the reach of the production costs of creating proper storytelling and how to embed these um, these events into the in entire annual campaign. Um, so, you know, I if you have anything to add of what facts you thought were helpful um, that you saw during these past two years, please write it in the chat. You can even unmute yourself. Again, this is a round table. So we want it to be interactive. We want you to speak up. You said, you know what? I actually do agree with that point of reaching larger audience or share your personal story. Again, this is a round table. And we want it to be super interactive. But um, Alyssa, you can jump in and take us to the next um, section, which talks about the challenges. Even though we have all these facts, what did we see um, were the areas that the pain points? Thanks, Rochelle. Um, before I get into that, does anybody want to chime in with, with anything that they saw? No pressure. 
And while we're, we'd, we'd love to hear, we'd love to hear from as many of you as possible. I am going to um, actually put our friends, I'm going to call out and give some props to our friends from Pangea, to Amy and her team, who are here, who put together a, did a remarkable um, and very successful gala towards the end of the last calendar year. And the marketing materials that they put together around it are things that I are, videos, stories from the field, the work they're doing in Africa that have, um, that I think they would tell you have just been incredibly evergreen. They took more care. They put more resources into building these. They made the event them itself a success and they are still, they're still being used and still being leveraged and are one of their strongest tools to this day. So um, yeah, shout out to them. This great example of how investment in a couple different areas could have incredible effects even moving forward. Uh, we Stephanie, Eric, you have you're Melissa Anson who has something that she'd like to add. Yeah, I was just going to add one thing that I've seen specifically for the last couple of years on events is um, not as much engagement with like a paddle raise or things like that in a virtual environment. So events that I've I've worked on in the past where we have donors raising their hands and live in the room together have had a lot more successful paddle raises. And when we've replicated that in a virtual environment, you know, there's not that peer pressure from the room. There's not the excitement, you know, you can, the storytelling is so important and, you know, we've still done that kind of thing, but it's, it's just something to note and be aware of. And I found it's helpful to plan for that, that you might not raise as much with that portion of event fundraising as you used to and try to get, try to get those gifts in ahead of time or in a more targeted way. That is a great point. Yes. And that goes to the next point, which is a, another fact is like the investment and having a stronger communication plan and engagement tools that it's not just about sending an RSVP and hoping people will come. There's a huge emphasis in the pre-event and the post-event. And of course you want members there. You want to say you had 200 people attending your virtual event, but there's a huge um, focus on that pre-event outreach and that commitment, um, as well as, you know, having that accessible and that fund open for after the event. And Melissa, one, one thing I'll, I'll say kind of on the other end of that, of that spectrum, auctions, silent auctions, raffles, things like that are something that we have act, kind of a, in a proven old school tactic that we see at these events that have become remarkably more effective since the pandemic. Since, especially if you keep an auction open after a pand after the event and tell people, oh, there's if there's Bulls tickets up for grabs, let our friends who aren't here know about it, give them the opportunity to participate. Um, we've seen a lot more money raised in that regard as well, whereas yeah, as opposed to things like cattle raises, which we noticed a pattern you've indicated as well. So um, yeah, let's keep it moving. And Alyssa would love to hear about some of the challenges that you have seen. Yeah, um, absolutely. So we can walk through these. Of course, um, as you know, we said already, I'd love for you all to jump in if there's anything that you've seen that we're not touching on here. Um, but the first one is pleasing everybody is just not going to happen. It never is like no matter what we're talking about. Right. So the biggest thing I just want to stress here is doing what makes the most sense for you and your programming and your mission. Right. So like we're working with um, a client right now and they wavered for, for a while on if they were going to do in person, like they planned, if it made more sense to go back to virtual, like they had a really, you know, difficult time and a lot of conversations trying to figure out what made the most sense for them. And ultimately their decision was, is they were planning to move all of their programming back in person. For 2022. So they felt that if they were moving their programming in person, it optically looked better if they were hosting then their events in person. And if they weren't hosting their events in person, why were they hosting their programming that way? So just figuring out, you know, what makes the most sense um, for your mission, your programming and, and your greater community. Um, of course, there are always that those 
people who you do want to get their input. You know, do you have an extremely high level major donor who you're going to want to know what they think? Yes, of course. Um, and you'll want to keep them in the loop around those decisions, but you shouldn't be making your decision based on one or two or, you know, five people. Um, so do what's best for you. Um, making the event accessible. So um, this is something we've been having a lot of conversations about both internally um, and with clients as well. Um, and I was telling our team that I attended a webinar last week now. Um, and the one of the biggest takeaways I took from that, and the presenters were um, mostly people who did have differing abilities and they were sharing their experiences. And one of them said, if there aren't accessibility pieces in place for me as a person with different ability, you are telling me that I'm not important to your community. And I think that was just a different way of hearing that, that um, we don't often think about, right? And, and a lot of times we think about these things and have these conversations based on the organization that you work within or that we're working with. Um, and they're very specific to that population. But I think we need to start thinking more broadly um, just about the greater community in general, right? So like maybe you are not an organization that you know, works with people with different abilities, but someone who's attending your event or someone who's joining your virtual event might need those different accessibilities. So how can we make it welcoming for everybody? Um, and we're actually working with Glassa right now and, and Kelly's joining us. I work closely with Kelly um, and we had a really thought provoking conversation last week um, just about they work with people who have visual and physical um, differing abilities and, and different sports as well. Um, and we're talking about their event that's going to be in person and what the best way to serve the food is, right? And like typically we're just like, oh, let's do um, let's do a plated dinner. But that's not an option at the venue that they're hosting the event at, which is is totally fine. The other options are family style, which of course is a different conversation now given COVID. Um, or doing a buffet. But we had a long conversation about that a buffet isn't accessible to people if they have to use, you know, different, um, like walking sticks. Kelly, I don't know the, the appropriate name. I know that's what we said when we talked. Um, or if they're in a wheelchair or if they need someone to help them, um, even if they have someone there who can help them, it still just kind of draws attention in a way that isn't necessary, right? Whereas if we do a family style dinner, they're sitting, it can be passed, nobody feels left out, nobody feels that you know they can't do what they wanna do. Um, so just really having those conversations and starting to think about those things, whether you're in person or virtual, um, you know, like how we have this closed captioning right now, um, that was a conscious decision. It was you know, something that we wanna do and something that we are recommending to our clients who are doing virtual events moving forward. Um, I'm going to move through the other ones of these pretty quickly, but collecting data on virtual attendees, like Rochelle said, um, virtual has allowed us to really expand who's able to join events for our clients. So you want to get their data, you want to get their information, right? Like, if you are in Illinois, and they're in California, like the likelihood of them being able to attend an in person event year over year is is not high. But if they joined your virtual event, if you are continuing to have virtual or hybrid, it's likely that they will be interested in joining or you can send them, you know, your communications and they're still interested. They might donate, um, whether it's a small amount that you could grow later. But if they were interested enough to join, they're likely interested enough to keep, you know, joining things if you are keeping them informed and involved. Um, so what team members do you need and no perfect platform? So platform really was something we started talking about and using, of course, during virtual. Um, this is more broad, right? Like moving forward now, like what venue do you want to consider? Even if you are going in person, maybe you want to consider being outside depending on the time of year or your comfort level. Like Eric mentioned, if you're dealing with a vulnerable population, um, maybe you're back in person, but you're still going to require masks or those people would be more comfortable if you were outdoors. So just considering, you know, all of those different options and, and think of platform as really like the holistic event. Um, team members, you know, that's, that's kind of up to you. Um, 
that hasn't changed much, really. I feel like you have your team, whether it's your internal team, your committee, volunteers, your fundraising consultants, and everybody has their jobs um, just to make sure, you know, timeline is being met and everything is getting done. Um, and then I'm just going to go to the last bullet point here, creating an entry point up until last minute. So this is where I think we're going to see a lot of challenge moving forward, actually, which it was great for virtual. But I think moving forward, we're going to see some challenge here. And that's where we've actually been getting some feedback, right? Like for the last two years, people have gotten into kind of the mindset of they can join these virtual events last minute. Like your event starts at 6 p.m. It's 5.50. You send that like our event is starting in 10 minutes. And they're like, oh, I'm free. I can join this event. That's not how it works for an in-person event. Your cutoff is likely a week, five days before, something like that. Um, so I think people, organizations are going to see a lack in committing to purchasing tickets for an in-person event, just because that's kind of how things have shifted. Um, even if there's like incentives, like early bird pricing and things like that, I think people just don't know their schedules and they're not wanting to commit. So um, that's something we need to talk about as a team that I think organizations need to talk about together. Like how can we either incentivize or really interest people to committing um, now that everyone's kind of on that last minute schedule of I can join, you know, five minutes before, which isn't the case for, for in-person. And I, I'd love to hear, and um, Krista, um, I saw that you actually submitted a question um, previously, very similar to that last point that Alyssa made, um, but kind of getting more to the core of how do we best market, um, how do we market these in-person events to maybe folks that have come in since, uh, that came in virtually in the first place, or that aren't in that expanded universe, but that maybe haven't participated with us before, which is uh, not an easy answer. I think it's an ongoing conversation, but certainly would love to hear from any of you that have had um, success or are, have events in the future that you, you've come up with creative ways to bring in these new folks and ideally bring them in more than a few minutes before the event starts. So, um, excellent. While we're... Um, one of so we've we've spent um, Alyssa and Rochelle have kind of walked us through some observations, some challenges that we've seen that they've that they've seen. Um, by the way, if anyone doesn't have the chat box open, make sure you look at it. There's some good dialogue going on there as well. The question is, and where we want to move, where we want to move towards is just what does this all look like moving forward? How do we take what we learn? How do we take the opportunities that have arisen and and it, regardless, like I said earlier, of what events look like moving forward, how do we how do we put them to work on our behalf? So to lead us in the conversation, I am going to hand off to Empowered uh, founder and CEO, Stephanie pestis -Weil. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Stephanie pestis -Weil, and I am going to talk about um, some of the key learnings that we have found um, and reflect a little bit more on what Rochelle and Alyssa both addressed in their, um, in their segments and, you know, really focus more on what are some of the best practices that we've been able to learn from the last couple of years and what do we want to take forward with us no matter what our event is, whether it's in person, whether it's hybrid, um, whether we decide to uh, maintain a more virtual um, event experience because of the population that we're serving. Um, so I just really want to start off by saying that I love events. Um, they're one of my favorite things that I do as a professional. Um, I think that um, they give us a unique opportunity to reflect year over year on how we did, how much money we raised, what our program looked like, who our leadership was. Um, there's many variables that, um, you know, that make an event amazing or challenging. And every year we get to uh, kind of take stock after our event and decide what are we going to incorporate going forward um, to make that 
that experience for our constituents um, that much more amazing uh, the previous year. We don't ever want an event to be the exact same or run in a stagnant way. So I would say that despite the challenges of the last two years um, and, and really, you know, a lot of the hard times that we've gone through, we've really uh, been able to uh, learn some things that I think are going to be val very valuable to the event experience going forward. Um, so the first thing is that, um, you know, leaders should lead by example, right? And we've always known that, but I think that um, what has gone on over the last years, what, you know, the last couple of years when we haven't had the chance to actually come together and experience an event together is what role are our leaders playing? And I think what we have found is they have to lead by example. So they have to sign up early. They have to be promoting your event on social media. They have to be forwarding out um, your uh, blast onto their, their, um, their, their contacts, their relatives, their friends. Um, it, we've been uh, doing a lot of really fun things with leaders, especially um, our client North Lawndale Employment Network, where we had our board members uh, create um, 30 second um, videos of themselves talking about the event and why it is important to them and why other people should attend. Um, so we really need to be putting our leaders out there in a way that is much more visible and active um, uh, going forward. Um, the other thing that I really uh, think that has been uh, really valuable is making our experiences very real time, um, giving people the opportunity to react to your events real time. So the use of the chat feature um, and the use of um, online conversations and back and forth um, is really been motivating for people. And, you know, so when we're at an event and we're sitting and it's a paddle raise and we're sitting there and they're asking us to make the gift, can we make that a much more interactive experience? Can we have a thermometer up on the screen so we can see the gifts going up and up. Um, we have a bunch of clients. Israel Cancer Research Fund has been doing that for a lot of years. Can you be playing music? Um, can you have somebody up there, you know, cheering people on as the paddle raises um, going? We've been using comedians um, throughout our virtual events to keep things fun and interactive. So what are ways that we can kind of pull people in instead of just, you know, it's time to raise money, how can we have a good time while we're doing this? And how can we have the energy and keep that up? And I think that that's something that we have not had. Um, it, it is a must. It was a must have in a virtual event. And I think it's something that we need to pull into the virtual and hybrid experience going forward. Um, uh, Rochelle talked about storytelling, and I'm going to address that a little bit later and get a little bit more in depth into that. Um, but just remember the power of storytelling. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Um, also, I think that something also Rochelle started talking about, and we're going to continue about that is the audience. Um, and we our reach has been so much wider. So the demographics, um, we've been able to pull in younger people, older people, people in all different geographic locations, people who can't afford ticket price. How do we still engage them? Can we have an in-person event and a hybrid experience um, where we, uh, you know, allow people to um, still be a part of our event? We have um, an organization, we have representation here, CJE Senior Life. Um, we're planning their Celebrate CJE event in September. And that's a big conversation that we're having right now is we're going to have an in-person event. And how do we also still, you know, they, they serve an older population and, we still want those people to be able to experience the event. So how are we going to make that possible? Um, huge, huge, huge change was pre-event hype, right? We typically sent out an invitation. We sent out an e-blast. We had some posting on social media. Pre-event hype has really changed dramatically. And I think we need to take that into consideration as we're moving forward. So as I said, the videos from board members, you know, posting those up. Um, this year with um, our uh, client North Lawndale Employment Network, we also gave a sneak 
peak of our program. We had a 90 second trailer that started off the program, but we released it ahead of time. And it just gave like a very high level, moving, inspiring look at what was going to go on during that event. So people got excited. They, they had a taste um, of, of what was to come uh, for the event. And I really, that we heard over and over again how motivating that was for people to sign up for the event. Um, donor acknowledgement. Do not underestimate the power of donor acknowledgement. Creating social media posts, putting them in e-blasts, sending a thank you out, you know, tagging them in posts. Uh, really, the donor, it, you, we cannot underestimate how many people look at that and say, oh, they're going to that event or they sponsor that event. I want to be a part of that too. So we, we always have thought of donor acknowledgement at the event, like what are we giving, what type of table are we giving, um, is their logo going to go on things, but how can we really incorporate that piece um, you know, into the event. And Alyssa's going to talk a little bit more on uh, cultivation and stewardship in a little bit. Um, and the final thing that I really want to touch on is that we have an opportunity to create a multimedia social experience for our donors. That is what we have learned. That is the takeaway from the last two years, that even our in-person events need to have that multimedia social approach. And, and you can have people in person experiencing it live, and it can be interactive, and they can also be interacting with people who are at home. Um, and, and that's really our goal. That's the challenge that we're giving to all of you. And, the, and what we want all of you to really think about going forward is how can we take that community building experience and follow that through from the point of your launching your event to the point of closing. Anything else that we want to pull in from the chat? Is there something that um, that we he heard that um, we want to touch on, Eric? Yeah, Stephanie, uh, Michelle from ICRF asked asked a good question that also might serve as a good a good transition in the opportunities. But how are you? How do you balance the ideal scenario? So like. How do you offer professionally done hybrid options with the reality of all the logistics and costs that would go into a virtual and an in-person component? Love your thoughts. Yeah, we're doing that right now with CJE Senior Life. Um, we've got, you know, Stephanie, Lisa, and Patty um, there. Um, right now, we're working with a production company that did our virtual event with us last year, and we're working with a couple of other companies. We're talking to them right now. And so it's like, how do we transition from purely virtual storytelling to that in-person model with also being able to provide access to um, those who cannot be there in person with us? And I think that that's a really important conversation to have with your production company. What type of services can they provide to you that are kind of like all encompassing? So we're thinking right now about, okay, the videos that we're creating right now, they can be used um, during the actual event, but how can we use them post event as well? Can we live stream the actual event? Should we be charging for the live stream or should we be still at, uh, providing that for free? Um, how are we engaging people at home during the paddle raise? Um, are we providing a text to give? Um, you know, are we gonna still be using some of these one cause streaming services, um, you know, where they still got the interactive um, experience, um, where they're watching it on a screen and they can still chat and they can make their gift real time. So I think that the challenge um, is to really look at the things that worked for your event um, when you were going through it virtually and try and see, can they actually transition really well? And a lot of times, the production companies and the streaming companies that you're, you've been working with will have some really good ideas for you um, as to how to make that work. Yeah, and I think what this is a perfect segue to kind of like the, you know, the big and uh, all encompassing uh, theme here, uh, which is like the opportunities, like how do we move forward? What are we taking with us as we are planning events moving forward, whether they're hybrid, virtual, or in person? Um, and 
The first thing is reach and accessibility, which is exactly this point. Uh, Michelle, to kind of jump on that question too, you know, the first question you should kind of ask yourself is, who is your audience? What is the goal of the event? Who are you trying to target? Are you doing hybrid because you know that majority of your people and your audience would want that virtual experience, or you're just offering it because you want to show and that you know your organization cares about both sides and wants to have that option. So I think first is knowing who your audience is. Will you have a good turnout? Are there things, are there, are there people that are not, wouldn't show up in person because there's no option? So that's kind of like the first question is really understanding who you are planning it for. Um, and with reach and accessibility, there are many ways to kind of tackle that. If you still want to create an experience for people that you were able to engage from the wider audience um, and the demographics, consider doing customized smaller events. So for your top donors, whether there's like a host party um, and you have smaller, uh, unique um, watch parties, so you people liked that smaller feel during COVID when you had lower um, people attending, um, but then you want to do a virtual one where you invite community. So there are different ways to play around with the amount of events, the amount of people. And if let's say you just want to be able to show the program into a lot of people, but you not necessarily want to prioritize the production cost for streaming, Facebook Live. Uh, Facebook Live is a great way to kind of show in, in, in live streamed in real time what's going on. Obviously, it may not be the best production, but you know, in this day and age, there's people who have a tripod, have lights, and they create a whole video on their social media. Um, so there are ways to cut down costs if, let's say, you want to give that option of showing um, it and, and showing it to a wider audience while still maintaining your in-person, you know, that that ambiance that you want to create. So there are so many different ideas, and as Steph said, there's so, the one of the beauty and another fact that we are taking with us um, from COVID is that you're able to really partner with so many different types of vendors that you would never have participated or collaborated with before. Um, so uh, one more thing on reach and accessibility as like one of the big takeaways is this closed captioning option, um, allowing more um, different options to, to accommodate different needs. Um, you know, again, the customized guest experience uh, and really just creating an environment where you could still interact with the, those people that you were able to build connection before. Um, and so that's the first takeaway. And then we can move on to the second takeaway. Um, so, Eric? Yeah, so I think reach and accessibility is easily one of the one of the primary themes that I'm hearing throughout the challenges and learnings and opportunities. I want to dive a little deeper, and I think storytelling was a theme that the, a theme that I heard throughout. Does one of you want to kind of um, talk a little bit more about at a high level where the opportunity lies there? Hi, sorry. Yes, I'm going to be discussing storytelling. Um, so I actually, uh, you know, Laura just wrote um, in the chat that integrating video into your program when introducing an honoree can be really powerful and more impactful than a talking head. And um, that is actually something I was going to, you know, discuss is, you know, we're all so used to with storytelling, you know, we didn't really... The, I think what we've learned from the last few years is really the power of a professional production. Um, and um, I think we're, as nonprofits, we're used to storytelling, right? We're used to storytelling through our end of year letters. We're used to storytelling through our, you know, the, the um, brochures that we put out there. Um, we were used to storytelling, um, you know, even at our events by having somebody get up there. Um, I think that something that has been really amazing and powerful is the use, as I said, of a productive uh, as of a production video um, and using multimedia um, to create those. Um, I was actually at an event two nights ago. This will show you that we are really moving to an in-person <laughs> um, a movement. Um, I was at an event two nights ago. Um, for 2,000 people, um, it was the day that um, the mask mandate was lifted, and there were um, many people in the room and many people unmasked, and 
It was like being back in the room a few years ago. So I think that there is definitely a, um, there is definitely um, a, a, an appetite out there um, for in-person events. Uh, so I don't think that you should feel guilty if that's the, the, the direction that you are heading in. I think people are ready for them. They're ready to be connected. But as far as storytelling goes, I think that the use of the production video um, is really important. We can use them to tell the story of an honoree. So um, having, um, instead of having somebody get up there and just talk about the honoree, putting together a two to three minute segment with stories being told by their family members or their friends or people that really can relate to them um, or you know individuals that they have had a direct impact on, let's tell those stories through a video, through using B-roll, um, and then have the person even accept the award um, through the power of the video as well, um, so that we're not sitting there nervous that they're going to give a 15-minute acceptance speech um, and send us well over our time. It's a way for us to provide a very beautiful insight into the um, of, into insight into why we're honoring people, how we're telling the story without things getting out of our control. We have much more control when we've really put that thought up front um, into the process. So um, I want us to really be thoughtful about how we're also using those videos pre-event and post-event. Can we use these videos um, to promote on social media? Can we put them up on our YouTube pages? If we have other events throughout the course of the year, can we also use snippets of those um, videos? We had a board meeting last night with one of our clients and to get them excited about um, the event coming up, we use uh, um, Stephanie Smerling from CJE Senior Life. She used one of the videos from the Celebrate CJE event um, to promote um, excitement uh, for the event. And so I think we have a really good opportunity to continue to tell our stories um, us utilizing multimedia sources. Excellent. And of course, what this all leads back to or where all of these best practices become meaningless if we don't put the proper focus on is just cultivation and stewardship and creating positive long-term outcomes. So Alyssa, you wanna talk a little bit about that takeaway? Yeah, I'm going to go through high level. And if anybody has any questions, um, chime in. And I just want to um, reiterate what Amy put in the chat, um, that Canva has a nonprofit program. So you can apply to get their pro version for free. Um, we use Canva for our um, marketing. I know a lot of our clients do. It creates beautiful things, or you can create beautiful things through there. So um, I just want to make sure if someone isn't looking at the chat or if someone is watching this back later, they are aware of that. So thank you, Amy. Um, as far as cultivation and stewardship goes, um, the main thing I want to say is obviously we know it's extremely important. And just going back to what I spoke about earlier and the feedback we're hearing that like people aren't as quick to kind of commit to attending these in-person events. That just like speaks to why, you know, cultivation and stewardship is so important. If you keep them engaged throughout this whole process um, and they know what to expect, they know that you're planning to do an in-person event, they know what that's going to look like, they then feel engaged from the beginning. And, and not that they're necessarily a part of the planning process, but that they feel like they've been consulted and you've kind of asked them or you've even just informed them before you've kind of informed everybody else, right? And, and that kind of can help them to feel the excitement that you know, you're bringing everybody back together. Um, and, and just to use Glassa as an example again, top of mind right now, their theme this year is reunion. And, and there are many reasons they picked that theme, but they're really doing a nice job playing up on the reunion. Like we haven't been in person in two years. Like let's all reunite and get back together. And, and that's also another good example of an organization whose programming is in person. That was a different one I was talking about before, but like their sports are in person, their programming is in person. So it makes sense for them to be in person. And they're also doing a separate hybrid portion for people who can't attend for whatever reason. Um, 
But back to really the overarching cultivation and stewardship, just keeping everybody informed and involved in your decision making and making them feel like they're part of the process um, really will help them to feel engaged and like they want to show up to, you know, support you in person. Um, and that's something we talk about as a team often as well is just like, and, and I know Rochelle touched on it, which is your event isn't a standalone, right? Like you should never only be contacting people when your event goes around, right? Like there's, there's never a reason why you should have a MailChimp or a constant contact list. That's like event only. And they only get your event communications, right? Like involve them in your annual campaign, let them know what's going on, share your successes with them, share your challenges with them, like add them to your mailing list. Assume that if they have signed up for your event, if they've attended your event, if they've donated to your event, they want to receive your materials. Let them tell you otherwise, but just keep these people informed throughout the year. Um, and I, I actually just want to jump really quickly in here. Also, I was at an event, this other event that I was at the other night, it was for a museum. And what I loved, loved is they said that anybody who was at the event that evening who made a donation had an opportunity to sign up for a VIP tour um, to go through the museum um, post event. And I loved that because it was something tangible. It was a next step that that organization gave to every single person in the room, um, uh, you know, to say, hey, you're important to us, no matter what level you're get giving at, you're here tonight, we're going to give you the VIP treatment. Um, and I thought that that was a very beautiful way to it got my brain going, thinking, oh, when can I go? When can I take my family? Um, so I think that we can also think of creative ways, um, even at the end of the event, to engage people with our program going forward. Absolutely. And so we have, we have about five minutes left and we want to make sure that we, um, we are leave some time to answer all of your questions. So if anyone wants to um, utilize the hand raise feature um, or feel free to drop it in the chat, would love to hear from you questions you may have or even ideas you want to share with the group here. Um, and while we're waiting for a couple to come in, I want to highlight a question that um, that Peggy from JCFS Minneapolis um, submitted before the call. Just realistically, and I think this is a good high level question to, to kind of kick this portion off with, but the trend of these hybrid events, which seems to be the default right now, like, is it sustainable? Like, realistically, is this something that we want to try and make work? Or is this something that ultimately we're kind of hoping we settle one way or another? Alyssa, do you want to take that? I was actually reading Amy's question. So I'm going to answer Amy's question <laughs> because I think it's a good question. Um, and, and it's not super specific, Amy, because we've been talking about that a lot with many of our clients doing smaller in-home events. And that's great, especially, you know, as you're engaging different groups of people, people who um, may have not been connected you, to you in the past. And it's a nice way for like your board members, your volunteers, your committee members to invite their network. And it's more of like, I was going to say safe space, but like it's less like pressure, um, as we were talking about with a panel raise to like donate, to be involved, like all of those things. Um, and yes, um, people do tend to pay for those. It, it really depends. Board members oftentimes will say like, I would love to host 15 people in my home. Um, and I'm going to pay for the refreshments or, or whatever it is. It really just depends on who it is and, and what they're offering, but that is not like an unrealistic expectation to think that someone would pay for that. Um, but I hope that answered your question. And I think it's a great idea. So and I, I think people, um, organizations are sometimes scared to put a price on an event, even if it's in at home. But I think people really appreciate activities. And even during the pandemic, like there were a lot of different like companies that were creating like home kits or home, you know, do it yourself, like paint nights and uh, people were paying for it. Um, and I think that especially if it's also linked to an organization, it's both the experience and I know it's for a good cause. So um, I don't think it's necessarily something we can 
shy away from, I think you can lean into it. Um, and I think that's also a great question. You can also ask your board, um, ask your host committee of what would they think? You know, they're the ones that are the audience. Um, so I think that's something else that we can also uh, think about. Just really quickly, because um, I know we've got to wrap up, but there is um, hybrid events are sustainable, but this is where you really have to be careful with your budgeting. You know, you have to look at your budget. You have to say, here's what our goal is. Here's how much we think that we can raise from the people that are in person. Don't forget that a lot of the people that were coming in um, that could not afford your ticket price, they may not be able to afford your ticket price, but they may be able to make a donation. And we want to keep those people engaged because maybe not now they can't make a thousand dollar donation, but maybe in 10 years they can. So I really do think we should see these events um, for people who can't afford it or not geographically in your area, see it as an investment um, in their potential giving to your, uh, you know, your organization down the line, expand your donor base of support and go deeper with them as much as possible. Excellent. We are, look at that, we are at 12 o'clock on the dot. I would imagine if I asked for people to put in emojis now, there might be probably be a lot of hunger emojis, but also hopefully some of the, some of the, uh, the light bulbs. We are so grateful you all took an hour out of your day to, um, to spend with us. Like I said at the beginning, you can expect an email later on um, with um, a survey. We'd love to hear your feedback on the call, a link to the video and uh, the part that we are most excited about. Uh, let us know if you want to continue the conversation. We know that no two organizations are the same. We knew we threw a lot, a lot at you, and we'd be happy to kind of help uh, help uh, funnel it down a little bit, focus on the areas, talk about how it can apply to your organization and your work. Um, so take a, take a look for that. Let us know if we didn't get to your question. We'd be happy to, to discuss it over email or over the phone. And thank you again for joining us and stay tuned for information coming shortly about our next Empowered Hour. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.